Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship on this beautiful Sunday. My name is John. I'm the pastor here at Vernon. Can we all just welcome those who are joining us online? Hello, everybody. Give them a big hello. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for doing that. Uh, my name is John, and we have so much going on today. And uh, before I get into it, we have a few announcements. Let me invite up the one and only Sherry Higgins, please, to start. And then Mike Simonson, as well, has a few announcements. I just wanted to say uh, today we have our bike blessing after church and Pastor John's band will be playing as well. We have food and beverages outside, so please join us after service. If you want to go home and change whatever, come on back. Uh, the bike blessing will take um, place right after service this morning. I want to shout out to the Lawrences, to the, uh, I don't know how to say Mitch and Amy's last name, uh, Mrs. Purdy, Denise and Chris Peterson, Penny Grant, myself, uh, the Winarski family, and I'm sure I'm going to miss someone, that's why I don't like to say names, uh, for coming and helping us park cars Friday and Saturday over at Balloons over McGuanago. Kyle was super excited. He get to look like he was working at the, um, that was Carter, that was looking like he was at the airport, and Kyle got the um, CBS, what's it called? Oh, walkie -talkie. walkie talkie. So he got to say, Roger this, Roger that. So he was pretty cool parking cars yesterday. 10 fours, yeah. and so we had a lot of fun doing that. And next week, hopefully, we'll be able to let you know all the funds we made from that. I think I did say Mrs. Purdy and Denise and Chris Peterson as well. So thank you to everybody who came out and showed their support yesterday to help with the community. And also, Pastor John's band is here. They're sitting over there. You guys just want to wave to everybody so they know who you are? Yeah. There they are. Yeah. Thank you, Sherry. They, they generally don't like to acknowledge that I'm their friend in public, so I appreciate you guys being here for that. 
And then I, the, yeah, it was so cool. My family and I went last uh, yesterday to Maxwell Street Days, and we stopped by the Balloon Festival for just a little bit. And our kids got a lot of treasures at the Maxwell Street Days. Uh, and, uh, and, we, and I saw Kyle out there with the walkie-talkie. The funny thing is, there was no batteries in that thing. He was just talking to himself the entire time. Uh, I'm going to invite up Council President Mike Simonson for a few announcements, and then uh, and then we'll begin worship. Uh, so just wanted to let everyone know, um, Sherry Obrick, um, who was our council secretary, um, has uh, resigned um, due to personal scheduling, just uh, doesn't have the available time to be able to fill that role any longer. And so we do have, we are looking for somebody who can help fill that role for us. Um, so if that uh, um, is something that you are interested in, willing to help and help us with the, uh, on the council with, in that role, that would be appreciated. And I'll let myself. Um, Pastor John or any of the council members know. Um, so as well, I just, uh, just wanted to make sure that she's aware, we do appreciate the service that she's provided for, uh, for the council for the last several years. Um, so th that's my primary note. So thanks everybody for coming today. Thank you, Mike. Hi right, friends, let us, we have more announcements? No, no? Oh, okay. All right, let us begin and prepare our hearts for worship. Just for my, for my well-being, let's take a deep breath. Let us prepare for worship. We come to you, O oh God, to thank you for what is good. We come to you, O oh God, to cry out for what is wrong. We come to you, O oh God, to ask for help and restoration. We come to you, O oh God, with aching hearts and glad souls. Friends, we know what God desires of us. That we do justice and love kindness and walk humbly with God. And we gather this morning to remind each other about that. To remember that now is always the right time to do these things. So with thanks in our hearts, let us worship our God together. I invite you to stand as you are able for worship this morning. the burning bush. Even in the wilderness, we have become comfortable. 
in your servant Moses, direct our gaze toward the path to which you call us. Come into this place and bless this, our worship of you. Hear our praise and receive our offering as we pray, sing, listen, speak, and discern according to your Holy Spirit. Come into this place, Holy God, and turn us aside that we may go out into the world and continue our worship of you. Amen. The reading today is from chapter 3 of Exodus. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmaster, taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Parasites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has come to me, and I have seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, what am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, if I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask, what is this name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, thus you shall say to the Israelites, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. Here ends the reading. Thanks. I get to invite up uh, a former astronaut. Brian, am I reading this right? No. No, okay. I get to invite up a, a friend of mine and, and somebody who's a new member. Uh, we welcome in as a new member, and he's going to share his faith story. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to it. Is that, is that good? That was, okay. was pretty good? All right. We rehearsed this a couple times, but well, I'll get it next time. Yeah. Thanks, brother. Thank you. I was instructed to raise the microphone. Yes, raise. <laughs> is it good? Yeah, All I right. think so. Um, so, a little over three years ago, on the morning of my 47th birthday, I sat beside my father at Angel's Grace Hospice as he took his last breath after a six-year battle with brain cancer. When the nurse came in, she told me he was probably waiting to be alone with me to let go. As she left the room, I felt tremendous guilt for not correcting her. I didn't deserve this. I felt she was mistaken. Her work hours matched the hours that I was there with my father, so I think she assumed I was always there. But the rest of my family had been there just as much, if not more, than me. My mother had spent pretty much all of her time in that period at the hospice. In fact, my mother and sister had just left that morning, uh, briefly, with the intent of coming back quickly. My mom went home to take her meds. My sister went out to stretch her legs and get some breakfast. I think I even arrived later that morning than what I had promised. I'm not sure if it was my father's will or God's will for him to pass at that moment, but it wasn't mine. I wasn't, it wasn't at all what I wanted. I didn't deserve it. 
but it was what I needed. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, can't blow. <blow. laughs> I, I needed to say goodbye without an audience. I, uh, I needed to gather myself before my family arrived so that I could support them. I just needed that time with my father. The uh, second thing that uh, many friends and family inevitably said was uh, that he wanted to go before my birthday, as if somehow it would have spoiled my birthday. Again, not my choice. <clears throat> but linking the two dates forever was what I needed. It serves as an annual reminder that I am my father's son. So much of what I am is because of him. The lessons he taught me, the sacrifices he made to provide for me, the values he showed me by denying me the immature wants that I thought were needs. It serves as an annual reminder that I am my father's son. So much, sorry, I am my father's son. I thank God for the day that I had the opportunity to tell him just how important he was to me. I think it was less than a year before the uh, day of his passing. We were driving back from train fest and uh, he told me he had wished he had never discovered the brain cancer and that it would just have taken him so that he could have avoided the long, difficult struggle. I told him in no uncertain terms that he was wrong. I used some words that I probably won't use in church. Um, but I told him how important it was that those extra years he gained through the brain surgery were to me and that I needed them with him. I am my father's son. Now every year I remind myself of that, of his and others' impact on my life. I'm also my mother's son. She showed me the true meaning of unconditional love a parent has for a child, no matter how many times I tried to test it. I am Michael Laura's brother. I am Pastor Paul's catechism student, who next to my parents had the biggest impact on my faith growing up. I am Jenny and Carrie's brother-in-law. I am Georgia and Tanner's uncle. I could go on for quite a while, kind of just focused on the faith and, and uh, family. But I'll mention two more. I am a member of Vernon Evangelical Lutheran Church, where from the moment I stepped through the doors, I felt welcome. I am proud to call Pastor John my friend and his style and that friendship is, is so reminiscent of what I grew up with in my faith. I know so much of who I am is owed to many people that had a positive impact on my life. Now every year before my birthday, I'm reminded to spend time throughout the next year thanking God for those who have provided so much influence on my life, to look for those sincere opportunities to truly thank them, and to pray for God's guidance that I may be that positive influence on others. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for shit story. Uh, for those of you who are visiting, we're in the middle of a sermon series called Who Are You Following? And uh, each week we have uh, a different theme, and, and each week we have a faith storyteller from within our congregation share a story of faith, a story where only God could pull them through, a story where God showed up, a story where they reflected on God's presence in their life in the midst of tragedy, or in the midst of heartache or joys. Um, Brian's story struck me. I'd heard a part of it before, but just 
Brian's honesty that we, I think, all share when we scream and cry out, God, this is not what I want. This is not how I want it to be. Yeah, Brian's faithfulness in spite of that is encouraging to me. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. And sorry for your loss. Let us pray. God, I give you thanks for Brian's story of faith, his life of faith, and for all the stories in this room. God, there are so many stories in this room and so many heartbreaks, so many scars, but so many moments of joy, God, but all of them, all of them, Lord, involve you. God, we know you're with us. And we ask for your spirit to enlighten us now, God, as we enter into your scripture, as we come together as a community, hoping to grow so that we can go out into the world, be your hands and feet. And it's in Christ's name we all say, amen. Amen. There comes a day in your life where you will find yourself asking these questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And if that hasn't happened yet, it will, I promise you. In this story from Exodus, Moses was having one of those days. There he was, minding his own business, tending his father-in-law's sheep, when God comes down to call him to action. This encounter with God at the burning bush is a central turning point in Moses' life. And by extension, friends, it's a turning point in the life of the Hebrew nation and our history as well. So at this momentous meeting, this this divine interruption of ordinary life, after he's hidden his face and taken the sandals off of his feet to stand on the ground that God has made holy with his presence, what does Moses do when he responds to God's call? Who am I? When called by God to serve, this is what Moses has to say. It's almost like Moses is thinking that God has confused him with someone else. Why, Why do you want me? He has a hard time understanding why God would want him to go back to Egypt. In fact, when he had just, the last time he left Egypt, it was because he had killed an Egyptian. Why do you want me to go back there, God? This must be a mistake. We, we are doing this six-part, we just finished this six-part uh, small class series on uh, God's messy family. And for those of you that joined, thank you. It was, it was a lot of fun. And we, and we walked through the book of Genesis. We walked through Abraham and, and Isaac and Jacob, our, our ancestors of faith. And we, and we ended with Joseph. And so if you don't know the story, God promises and makes a great covenant with Abraham and, and the Israelites. Uh, we'll, we'll, the number more than the stars is the promise he gives to Abraham. And you fast forward and, and, and Abraham's grandson, Jacob, has a number of children. And one of them is Joseph. And we all know the story. Joseph had a beautiful what? Coat. Yeah. And Joseph's brothers really liked him? No. No, it was either murder or enslavement. They chose enslavement. So I guess it was better than murder. But Joseph eventually frees, is freed and becomes second, essentially, in command in Egypt. And you, you leave Genesis thinking, oh man, like the Israelites are off to a great start. And then Exodus begins and it says that Joseph, it, this is literally one verse, I think, Joseph and his ancestors die. And then it moves on. And it talks about how the Pharaoh realized that the Israelites were multiplying, just like God promised, at a crazy rate. And so the Pharaoh and his counselors were nervous, and they said, you know what, before this gets out of control, we need to enslave them. And they do. Well, even though they were enslaved, they kept multiplying. And so the Pharaoh's like, all right, look, tell all the midwives, when Hebrew boys are born, kill the boys. When Hebrew girls are born, let the girls live. But they kept multiplying. They kept multiplying. And so he pulls the midwives in. This is in Scripture, and he says, I told you. And they said, look, I don't know, those Hebrew women are hardy. By the time we get there, they've already given birth. And so they they keep multiplying. And so he issues a decree to the whole land. All male Hebrew children must be killed, thrown in the river. Well, Moses was saved, was sent down the river, and was found by people from the house of Pharaoh and brought in and raised as a prince of Egypt. And so, raised in that home, he saw these things that were happening and probably assumed they were normal. Until one day, when he was out and about, and he saw an Egyptian soldier beating a defenseless Hebrew slave, and something in him snapped, and it says that Moses struck him and killed him. So Moses takes off. 
Moses ends up eventually working as a shepherd, marries the daughter of the man who he's working for, and essentially has started a new life. And this is what Moses will be doing now forever until this scene. So here he is starting over, and God wants him to go back. And quite frankly, Moses doesn't really mince words. He doesn't want to go back. For most of this chapter and the next one, Moses gives excuse after excuse after excuse. And you should read Exodus 4. It's beautiful. And God does these amazing things. Turns Moses' hands into ash and then forms him back up into hands again. Reminding Moses of his power. But he's just convinced in this moment that God has the wrong person. How will he accomplish what God wants him to do? And as I kept rereading the story, a story that maybe we're all familiar with, the burning bush, I I realized if I'm honest, if we're honest, we're not that different than Moses I mean, it's exciting to see God, right? You have those moments where you see God, and maybe it's not a burning bush, but you see God, and you're like, whoa, this is holy. But today, you and I get to hear God's word. That's just as holy. We get to encounter God's gifts given freely to us because you're in the presence of the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and it's exciting to be called by God out into the world to be made to be his people, to be given a new identity in Christ. Friends, we, look, we enjoy this community. I, I enjoy this community, this family of faith that surrounds us, supports us. But like Moses, if we're really honest, despite all of that, it's sometimes hard to get excited to do the work that God has called us to do. Who am I? Who, who am I? There are days when my honest response to God is, God, I know for a fact you're looking for somebody else. Why do you want me? I can't do what you're asking. It's out of my realm of experience. I'm not qualified to get that done. I'm too busy with something else. I'm a crazy sinner. You have no idea, God. I've been hiding all these things from you, God. God, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid, God. We're all the same. You, me, and Moses. We're not that different. But the thing about today's text as I read it is it's not really about Moses at all. It's not really about us at all. It's about the one who is calling him. Moses questions God's call to action. Who am I to do these things? But instead of answering that question, God gives the better response. Here's who I am, says God. God sends Moses to Egypt with his name. The divine, the personal name of God. Most English Bibles replace the word uh, Yahweh with Lord in all caps. If you open your scripture up, you would find in this reading in Exodus, Lord would be capitalized, L-O-R-D. That is Yahweh. I told the kids in the early Hebrew scriptures, they knew God as El Shaddai. Great are you, Lord. See, we, our English language, I have to remind you guys once in a while, the Bible wasn't written in English. We know that, Right? So it was, it, it was written in a number of languages. One of the earliest was Hebrew. And in the Hebrew language, these words mean so much more. And for them to have a simple word like Lord to name God would seem insignificant. No, great are you, Lord. Now, an exclamation, El Shaddai, and then Yahweh. And in Hebrew, it's spelled Y-H-W-H, pronounced Yahweh. Before this moment in Scripture, God had named God's self El Shaddai, but now God has given him a personal name. He got to saying, call upon me. I am your personal, attentive God. Call upon me, Yahweh saves, but I am. Yahweh is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh is the creator of the universe, and his name means something. God says to Moses in Exodus, I am who I am. And then he says, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Yahweh is a name of action. It doesn't simply mean I am who I am because the word also means has been and will be. Yahweh is the being, the doing, the, the ising. Can I make that word up? The ising. Yahweh is all those things. God's name speaks to God's character. Yahweh is the one true God. Yahweh is in action. Listen, there's some other verbs in, in the, right before this passage. I want you to listen to these It talks about God's response to the plight of God's people. This is Exodus 2. And God heard, 
It's a personal God, attentive God. God heard their groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. And how does Yahweh, the being, the doing, the ising, how does that God respond? I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, Yahweh says, and to bring them up out of that land into a good and broad land. God has come to save. Remember in the story of Joseph, his brothers, they come up to him. He he is now distributing all the food for the Egyptians, and they come up to him, and, and Joseph says these wonderful words. You intended it for bad, but God intended it for good, right? You tried to get rid of me. Look what God has done. The Egyptians, they they want to get rid of all of the Israelites, to the very least subjugate them. And and we have another situation where you tried to do bad, but God did good through it. And, And God is trying to tell Moses this. My promise is true. And remember God's promise to Abraham? It was a covenant. It was a covenant not just to bless Abraham and the Israelites, but to bless all nations Through the Israelites, God has come to save all people. And God is reminding Moses of this. God knew who Moses was. He knew Moses long before he called him out in the burning bush, before his Hebrew mother put her baby boy in a basket in a river, could you imagine, and sends him down there to save, hopefully, his life. Before he was drawn up from that river and raised in the house of the Pharaoh, before he spent decades learning to be a shepherd after running away from Egypt, God knows who Moses is. So when Moses asks God, who who am I that I should go to the Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? God could have said, you are the one that I've been preparing for this since the moment you were born. But really, it's not that important who Moses was. What's important is the fact that I am who I am is sending Moses with his name. You know, there's a number of my good friends and, and their beautiful wives and my bandmates here. And a couple of those guys are in a, a men's group with me that I've been in for years. And I like the group because I'm the youngest one there. And, uh, and I like to learn from the older guys. That's what I meant by that. <laughs> and I, uh, <laughs> see, I took a chance to do that. But uh, there's a guy in this group. Uh, there's a guy in this group who maybe you've heard me talk about before, but his name's Gary Fields, and, uh, and he's a dear friend to all of us and a brother of mine. And Gary is famous, uh, for, <laughs> in my mind, for so many things. But one of the things I love about Gary is Gary has said to me on more than one occasion, John, you are not the great I am. <laughs> the fact that you all laughed <laughs> means <laughs> you knew I needed to hear that in that moment. But he would tell me, John, you are not the great I am. Gary is a man who conquered demons decades ago. Who put aside addiction in pursuit of his God and family. Who models a life in the midst of struggles like all of us. But who lives in a way that teaches me it's not about him. It's never been about him. It's been about what God has called him to do through Christ Jesus. To go into the world. A world that is not receptive to this message of unconditional love. A world that's suspect of grace and forgiveness and mercy. Gary says to go into that world, but you can't do so successfully believing it's about you. I am not the great I am, and I wonder how many of us need to hear that from time to time. God promised to be with Moses. Yahweh says, but I will be with you. Moses, calm down, Moses. I'm going to be with you. And this should be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Before anything else, the Lord gives Moses his promise. I am also means I will be. When God called Moses to action, he wasn't sending him out alone. Yahweh will go with him. And the Lord gives you that same promise in Christ Jesus. Who am I? You are a redeemed child of Yahweh through Christ. It doesn't matter who you were before. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you bring into this room. It doesn't matter what you carry with you when you leave. You have a God who loves you, a God who invites you to this table, a God who sits with those who will betray him, those who will renounce him, those who will turn their back on him and says, in spite of all of it, I love you. It's not about you. It's about who God is. You have nothing to offer, yet God takes all of it through the working of the Holy Spirit who draws us up and gives us new life in the waters of 
baptism and in the community of, of this church and other communities, you have this new identity that's being recreated every day. Remember, Luther w- would rise and die. He said every morning his prayer was to, to die and rise with Christ, to die and rise with Christ. This reminder that putting aside these things is going to be a journey. But that if he really focuses on the fact that Yahweh is, is the point of all of it, not, not us, it begins to change, and there's life in that, and there's joy to be found in that, and, there, and there's unconditional love focused in that that becomes easier for you to live out and experience. God's washed away the sins of the past. We bear God's name. In Genesis 1.27, it says, El Shaddai created us in their image. We, we bear God's name. Did you come in here and take your sandals off in this holy place? And it's holy because of those who are gathered. Next to you are the created images of God. Yahweh calls you to action as his child, and he sends you with his name. He might be calling you to work that is seemingly impossible. As I mentioned earlier, the the title of our sermon series is, Who Are You Following? If you're following Jesus... As his disciple, then I can tell you from personal experience that that is a task that none of us can accomplish alone. It's a task that you will stumble upon at times, but it's a task that is so life-giving. It's a task full of endless grace, forgiveness, and mercy. It's a task where you're gifted the power, the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, if you would only believe, Peter says to the church, Oh, if you would only believe the power within you because of God to change the world. But there's a promise, right? Because as God did with Moses, God promises to be with you. The name Jesus is the Greek form of the Hebrew Joshua. And Joshua means Yahweh saves. We have God who saves each and every day. Never stops saving In the Greek, it's a continuous action. God is saving every day, every second, every moment. Saving, saving. Never stop saving. You don't need to worry or question who you are. That's why I titled this sermon, Thank God I'm Not God. (laughs) How many times do we have to shout that out in the heavens? Thank God I'm not God. And sometimes it doesn't make sense. And sometimes it's frustrating and it's heartbreaking. But in the midst of it, friends, I promise you, you have a God who has not abandoned you. You have a God who told Moses, I will be there with you. I send you with my name. Call upon my name in those moments. You belong to Christ Jesus, friends. And it is he who makes all the difference. Let us pray. God, help us to come before you like Moses each and every day, acknowledging that you are the great I am. And God, let us share that news with the world, that we have a God who gives us his name, that we have a God who is with us and promises to go with us and before us. God, help us to surrender to you, especially in those moments, God, when it seems impossible to give all to you. Help us to be a faith community that encourages each other, that reminds each other of your promise. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's join together in the creed of our church. my guitar. (laughs) Let's profess our faith. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again, and he ascended into heaven, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Join me in a time of prayer for our church, our community, and the whole world. God, let us be a people 
that trust you. Though it took a bit of conversation, Moses would eventually go and free your people because Moses believed that you were going ahead of him, that you were with him. God, help us to trust in those moments where the odds seem impossible, that you, in fact, are with us and all things are possible. Lord, in your mercy. God, thank you for giving us this time and this space that we could be encouraged as a community and that we could go out into the world to share this good news. God, equip us for that. Lord, in your mercy. God, we lift up to you all those who are suffering in mind, body, or spirit. Those who are brokenhearted, those who are grieving, those who need your constant presence. God, let, let us be that presence if we need to be, Lord, for them. And we lift up all those in our hearts and minds now at this time. Lord, in your mercy. God, we thank you. We thank you for the lives of those who have bore witness, who have given testimony to what being faithful means. Those who are laid at rest now, God, but who have gone before us, those saints in the church who will gather with us in just a few minutes when we break bread together, we thank you for their lives and their witness and their memories. Lord, in your mercy. God, we lift up all these things and so many more to you, trusting that you are with us, that you go before us. And we lift them up to you in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Friends, the peace of the Lord be with you always. I encourage you, as you feel comfortable, more comfortable in worship, to share that peace with one another. Peace. God's peace. God's peace, everybody. Let us give thanks to God for these gifts. Almighty God, I'm constantly humbled by the generosity of this congregation to this church and this community. Lord, we thank you for the gifts of this table, God. We thank you for the gifts given in so many other ways. We thank you that we can be a church that is generous because you are generous to us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You ever see a Pentecostal preacher just preach like a three-hour sermon? And they're just... (laughs) Mine was only 15 minutes, but I'd like to invite my communion assistants up here at this time. If you're visiting... Uh, then these words may be new to you. If you're, if you're a long-time attender, remember, then you hear this each and every week. But I love this meal. I love that this meal, a meal that is too oftentimes uh, presented as some formal occasion. It was most likely an informal occasion. They were gathered together, not sitting at a long table. They were sitting in a way that they could face each other, probably on the ground with some cushions. And they were breaking bread. They were eating a meal. How many wonderful memories do you have around a table breaking bread with people? And so Christ is doing this with his best friends and their family. And during the course of the meal, he surprises and probably confuses all of them by taking the bread, blessing it, breaking it, and giving it to all to eat, saying, this is my body broken for you. Do this in the remembrance of me. And then after supper, as they were most likely lounging and relaxing after a delicious meal, he surprised them yet again. He poured the wine, blessed it, he gave thanks, and he gave it to all the drink, saying, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people, all people. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Let us pray the way our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Friends, here at Vernon, we will serve communion uh, down here. We will dismiss this section and this section, and then we will move over to this section. If there's anyone in the back, we will come out and serve communion to you. If you're unable to come forward, we'll bring communion to you in the seats. And if there's someone in the parking lot, please pull up and we will bring communion out to you. Grape juice and gluten-free wafers are also available. All, all are welcome at Christ's table. pray. God, thank you for the promise of this meal. Thank you for the sustenance that we find in it, God, not just through food, God, but through the promise of the Holy Spirit, through the promise of the community gathered, and through the promise of being with the saints who have gone before us. God, you've equipped us now, and you've called us to go out into the world, Lord. Let this strengthen us this week. It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, before uh, the blessing and our song, uh, we have our bike blessing outside, and it's going to be a lot of fun. There's food. Uh, there's a mediocre band. There is, um, there is, not you guys. That's a slam on me. I'm sorry. That's a slam on me. Uh, there is food. There is going to be fun games. Um, I don't know. You know, Sherry, she's got, there's a million awesome things going on out there. Uh, and so please, please uh, stick around, if anything, just to kind of jeer at the band. Uh, for a little bit, but if you do have bikes or bicycles or motorcycles or tricycles, what's it called? A trike? Is it a trike? You like when I call you out in worship. Okay, good. A trike? Whatever it is, please get those uh, into a coordinated off area. It's a harder word. And, um, and we're going to have a blessing, and they'll start right about 1030, okay? So if you guys and gals can please come join us outside. It's beautiful out. There's food. I don't know how else to entice you. God wants you to go join us, okay? <laughs> let us, let us go out today with this sending. May the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. Amen.